Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of My JavaScript Story. This week, we're talking to Jeremy Fairbank. Jeremy, do you want to say hi? Hi, Jeremy Fairbank here. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. You want to just give a brief introduction, who you are, where you work, what you do, all that stuff? Yep. Uh, so I am a software engineer and consultant. I work for Test Double uh, remotely. Okay. And uh, our kind of mantra is that we believe software is broken and we're here to fix it. So we like to not only help teams um, work on their backlogs and get stuff done, but also to help your team improve and grow um, through whatever means necessary, whether that's doing product coaching or just helping with the backlog grooming and uh, what other other types of consulting we can help out with. Um, and then I am based out of Hawaii. So it's a big time difference here for me, but uh, looking forward to it. Yeah. So uh, where in Hawaii? Are you on Oahu or? Uh, I'm on Maui, actually. Maui. Oh, nice. Tiny little town, <clears throat> kind of a touristy town, but it's called Paia on the North Shore. Oh, nice. Very but, cool. Yeah. Yeah, I've never been to Maui. I've been to uh, uh, Honolulu and uh, to the North Shore on Oahu a, a few times. So Nice. We want to get there eventually. We've only ever been to Kauai before this for our honeymoon. Oh, cool. Still lots to explore for us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I've got a few other friends that live out there or have lived out there. and It sounds like a quite the interesting place to live, so... <laughs> No, yeah, it's every day is an adventure. We love it. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, um, this, this particular interview is about your uh, experience as a programmer and kind of your story. And to start us off, I'd really like to just uh, kind of wind back to where you got into programming. Uh, where, how did you get into programming? Yeah, it's, uh, thinking back, um, the first little bit, bits of, I guess you could say programming I got interested in was probably, I want to say it was 11, 12, 13, somewhere around that age. Um, so back in middle school, mm -hmm. high school for me, um, I just wanted to fiddle around with HTML a lot. I was, I was really into Dragon Ball Z back then, which I'm sure a lot of middle school boys were at the time. <laughs> so I was big into like, there were these Dragon Ball Z forums and everyone was like you could level up on the forums and whatnot right like role play fighting and stuff and so i was like i want my own so i somehow i managed to fiddle enough with html never learning anything and cgi bin scripts i don't even know if i was using <laughs> back in the day i i just remember i was able to get it working and i was able to customize it and i was pretty proud of that nice but i didn't take that anywhere um because i'd always been on the the pre-med type of path, I thought I was going to be a doctor. So by the time college rolled around, I was going the pre-med route. And then I was like, I don't know if I want to be a doctor because I, I wasn't wanting to like commit tons and tons of hours every week, mm -hmm. just because I know doctors put in a lot of hours. So I really enjoyed chemistry. And so I said, okay, I'm going to get my chemistry degree and maybe go to grad school or just get a job. I, I wasn't quite sure. So I, I ended up getting an undergraduate degree in chemistry. Um, and then I, I worked in some summer programs and thought it was going to be like really cool. I'm going to discover all these things with these grad students and, you know, maybe we'll create something awesome. And it's like every day I was collecting samples from like a, this huge, they're called high performance liquid chromatography machines. Mm -hmm. Like you 
filter filtrations and or yeah filtering and separation of um, chemicals and that kind kind of got boring after a while and so I think I discovered like I love the theory and the problem solving aspect of you know chemistry in class but not really doing it in the lab um, and so I I don't want to say I had an existential crisis per se but it's like I, I thought, you know, I'd really like to go back to fiddling with computers. And so it was after that point, um, I kind of took a short little break during college. And um, at the time, I had been fiddling around a little bit with Photoshop. Um, I'd done a little bit of still web stuff um, for like a freshman seminar in college where I built a website with Dreamweaver and Photoshop. So <laughs> all the famous macromedia slash adobe tools yep um but i had a good friend who runs a uh he and his brother they run a manufacturing company back in tennessee where i used to live and they needed some graphic design and web design help at the times so they're like hey do you want to come help out with that um so that's where i really started to you know i was doing the graphic design but then you know starting to get to play with some PHP, they had a lot of PHP websites and a little bit of JavaScript. And that's where I really, I guess, got my first taste of truly programming per se. And that's not to say, you know, HTML, I think is awesome and you can program with HTML too. But I think the first time I felt like I was programming, you know, so we, so, you know, I, I did that for a while. I went back to school. I, I ended up getting my degree in chemistry, but you know, I, I plan to just still go that route because I didn't think that computers were going to be a career path for me because I just kind of did that as like a summer thing for them. But as fate would have it, after I graduated, their web um, designer and developer left the company and they're like, hey, do you want to come back and just be our full-time web guy? And I'm like, because, <laughs> sure. you know, I was just looking for chemistry jobs at that point. I still wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life. So I took that offer and um you know, I recognize I was incredibly privileged to have this opportunity, um, having those kind of friends. And I was able to just use that time to really hone my craft. I was spent there five years, I believe, um, just maintaining their websites. Mm -hmm. I didn't really have a mentor per se. So I relied heavily on like blog posts on, you know, kind of honing my craft, so to speak, and becoming, um, you know, mindful of you know, good patterns to use, even if in PHP and, and obviously in JavaScript, starting to build um, some things out with like Backbone um, when it, for some of the front end stuff they needed. Um, and then started getting to Ruby on Rails there too, uh, later on for a project, pretty big project I built for them. So, you know, yeah, I was kind of a self-taught person, um, heavily leaned on outside materials to kind of guide me along that path too, uh, since I didn't ha really have that mentor figure. Um, so that's, that's kind of my story, how I, you know, got involved in programming, probably a lot of people's story. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. I'm, I mean, I've talked to a lot of people and there are a lot of ways that people have, you know, come into the field or, you know, yeah, things like that where, initially, yeah, some of them, it was, well, I, I did it when I was younger and then, yeah, you know, I, I pursued a different path and now I'm here again. Uh, there are other people that they just kind of kept fiddling with computers all the way through college and then wound up getting a degree um, in computer science or not in computer science sometimes. Um, and then there are folks that I've talked to that, you know, they, they didn't even think about learning how to code until they were adults. And they realized that the career path that they had chosen for themselves wasn't where they wanted to end up. And so, yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, I don't know if there's a typical path. Um, I, I think there used to be, but even the computer science degree route is becoming less and less typical. So mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting just to, to see where it all kind of comes together. Um, now you mentioned that, uh, you know, these folks, um, they had to come back and be their web guy. And I know a lot of people that, it seems like that's kind of their first job is they, you know, they graduate and then somehow, yeah, people they know or um, people that they're associated with wind up, you know, hey, you're a computer guy and they just hire you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm curious, though, 
as you got into it, it sounds like initially they just wanted you to build websites for them. And then it became more of a application development position. So how, how did you go from being the website guy to the, I'm going to build stuff in Ruby on Rails or JavaScript or whatever? I think it was a, a matter of, you know, oh, you know computers, so you clearly know how to just do these other things. Of to course. Learn how to do it. Exactly, yeah. So that, <laughs> that's kind of how it started out. It was, I mean, there was some application level business rules to consider for some of their PHP websites. Right. They weren't using like WordPress at the time. So some of that was like um, built on some just frameworks. Um, and eventually I had brought in some other things like Code Igniter, if you remember that way back in the day. <laughs> yes. Um, but some of the other thing, like this is, I don't normally show this, but like, you know, I did some, you know, visual basic for applications uh -huh. for them, like some, I mean, not super old school, but it's, you don't typically hear about that, like working with access, Microsoft access databases and building no, up not really yeah. on top of that. So, you know, I got into some of that, that was interesting to say the least, especially for someone with so little programming experience. Lots of buggy-ness in that, but <laughs> it was just mainly, yeah, the, yeah, they had needs and, you know, I, I used the problem-solving skills I had and the resources available to me online to start to um, address those. And so that, that kind of ballooned out into other application um, interaction, building applications, interactions with like their ERP software, whatever they needed. So, you know... It's an interesting time. It, you know, it's, it's, it was an incredible opportunity too because being a single person working on that, you're not limited by a team and best practices per se or idioms. So not to say that some of the stuff I decided to do wasn't maybe the cleanest or best code per se, but it's a really freeing opportunity because you can just really explore and try lots of stuff out, even if it's not the most performant thing at the time. Um, and so I was grateful for that. Um, at the same time, it, you know, I, I hearken back, I didn't have a mentor that that could have been a useful thing to have too. Maybe could have guided me along a little quicker and learning some things better, mm -hmm. but so yeah, that's kind of the, how it kind of evolved just as, they had needs. I, I tried to fill it as best as I could. Yeah, makes sense. How, how did you get into JavaScript? Because it seems like that's uh, a direction you've taken. I mean, you know, you came on and talked, I think it was episode 325. Um, you talked about functional JavaScript and, and functional language, the languages that are related to JavaScript like Elm. But um, mm -hmm. how did you get into JavaScript in the first place? Um, so I would say it was definitely... Um, with working on their websites where there were little one-off scripts um, or many. So this company like has a lot of different businesses underneath them. So that's why I say multiple sites. <clears throat> so it was just, you know, fixing bugs and those. Um, so yeah, it was, and also um, picking up a copy of Nicholas Zakis book, uh, professional JavaScript for web developers. I remember reading through that whole thing over like a Christmas break um, and just like absorbing all the wealth of knowledge in that book about the prototype um, object model and closures and, and everything. And so that was really enlightening um, and I guess helped stoke the fire for my love of JavaScript. Um, so it along with PHP were like my first really my first languages. Um, and the funny thing was I was using JavaScript so much. I loved it so much. It was hard for me notice to notice like all of the complaints people had with JavaScript because a lot of people would come from other or traditional languages. Um, yeah, I, I had that um, opinion myself. I mean, there were just things about it that weren't na uh, natural or native to me coming mm -hmm. from Ruby. Yeah, so that it was interesting for me to kind of unlearn that and be like, oh, there are problems with this language, even though it seemed like it was perfect at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, just, you know, and I kind of expanded on that. I really liked working with it. And so I, I looked for opportunities. It was like, okay, can we make this a more 
you know, flesh out the, the front end here more and make it more of an application. And that's where I brought it in like backbone and stuff. And then single page applications became a big deal, Ajax and all that. And I'm like, well, I'd like to incorporate this. And, you know, and of course my, my friend slash my boss, you know, really loved it. He wanted to kind of be more progressive on technologies used. So he gave me that opportunity. He's like, I'm going to make this a single page application. Uh, I'm going to try out knockout. Um, and then, you know, I brought in Marionette uh, with Backbone too. I worked actually worked with Derek Bailey. He came in and consulted with me for a bit. Um, so that was probably one of the first like mentor type figures I had um, where he came in and helped me build out a pretty full fledged, probably the biggest app I had built at the time with Backbone and Marionette. And so I was, was really, for a while I was really invested in that community too. I was, a part of the marionette core team for a short while. Um, and then I think just the advent of things like React and then Angular. There was Angular JS still going on, but then Angular 2.0 was coming up. And I think, you know, those things kind of took over the, the JavaScript ecosystem more with what we have nowadays. Yep. Yeah. And I, I got to know uh, Derek fairly well. Um, from marionette and yeah he's a terrific guy and uh yeah i mean just lots of stuff there and and you know it kind of reminds me of a lot of the things that that i did um you know going back uh, along the same journey you know with some of the javascript stuff especially once we had things like knockout and backbone and marionette and things like that yeah i mean it's it's interesting where things are now um so how did you how did you get from there to working on more functional things like Elm and functional JavaScript? So that was, I had um, I had heard about Coursera, and mm -hmm. you know one thing I, I had always, had always bothered me is that I never really like formally learned programming or computer science, which. You know, nowadays, really, that's not necessary. And I, I guess I should have listened to myself back then to not put that kind of pressure on myself. But right. um, I was looking for some of the courses on Coursera because I was curious. And uh, one of them was called Programming Languages. I think it is um, out of the University of Washington. I, I can't recall the professor's name for that course. But it was essentially a functional programming class. It touched on object-oriented principles too, but that was my first taste of functional programming. So we were using uh, standard ML, kind of an older ML variant, which you know Haskell and Elm are based off ML languages. And um, it also used Racket, which is kind of an educational variant of Lisp, even though you can still build apps with it. And so kind of walking through that course, the principles of functional programming, where you're just operating on data, there aren't really objects, um, and that you're striving for functional purity, data goes in, data comes out, and it's predictable and deterministic. And that just, I don't know, that really excited me because maybe I'm just, maybe I was just a bad object-oriented programmer at the time, but I was, I, you know, I hit a lot of stumbling blocks. Um, I was still, you know, kind of a relatively inexperienced programmer, still learning, but so it was that course that kind of really um, got me excited about functional programming. So I was like, oh, I, you know, as anyone does, I need to take this back to JavaScript and just do these types of principles in JavaScript. Um, and so that's where I started applying just, you know, simple things. Oh, I'm going to make this function pure. I'm going to make it small. I'm going to, ooh, I can curry it. That's fun, you know? And I really enjoyed that. And I think I, I kind of took that passion to now wanting to share that um, and, and teach a lot about functional programming with conference talks. And, and then eventually, you know, I kind of brought that over to Elm. And so with Elm, I had heard about it, you know, I think when it first came out, which was in 2012, but it was, fairly small surface area as far as what it could do. Uh, it was mainly a lot of the demos were canvas based where that was games. Um, but then around mm -hmm. 2016, you know, I'd been pretty involved in the functional community by that point, speaking a lot about functional programming with JavaScript. Um, and this was when I was still in Tennessee. 
uh, a buddy of mine who's a functional advocate, Reed Evans, um, had been fiddling with Elm. It's like, hey, you got to check this out um, because it was had all those principles built mm-hmm. in and it was statically typed. So you had right. compiler safety. And I think around that point is when it, you know, started getting a lot more features that made it a viable option for building front end web applications. So I checked it out and then I really fell in love um, because it, it gave me all those things. I didn't have to, you know, bring in extra libraries or kind of um, hack on functional things with JavaScript. Um, like you can't guarantee purity in JavaScript. You can write pure functions, but at the end of the day, the computer can't prove that that's pure per se. Whereas with Elm, you have that compiler safety to guarantee that for you. And that's what really attracted me to it because I can, it enabled me to have more confidence in the applications I would like to build. It made it easier to refactor because the compiler could ensure sort of my integration points from one module to another are kind of safeguarded by those static type checks. Uh And that's kind of what's led me up, I guess, to current day Jeremy, um, really enjoying the functional world. Cool. Now, is functional the approach that you take at test level? Or are you kind of open to pursue whatever you want? It's, me personally, it's, a typical approach that I, I obviously prefer to take. I mean, you, you still run into challenges with right. whatever client you're at and whatever the state of their code base might be in. You have to work within those parameters too. And sometimes you have to, you have to bend your own rules. I mean, nothing for me feels like it can be always ideal like I would want it. Maybe on a mm-hmm. greenfield project, but that's not always the case with client work. So you know, I try to find the balance where I, where I can. Um, that's where I bring in, you know, right now I'm on an, actually on a Elixir and Elm project at Test Double. So it's been a great opportunity to still use a lot of functional programming there. Um, with Elm, you're, you know, I'm, I'm super excited to, to get to work on that in production. But on the Elixir side, you know, you can still get away with, you know, things not being pure. And so that's where I still heavily lean on, you know, using TDD and trying to keep modules small and focused if possible. So if I'm writing something new within the application, I can um, keep those functions pure, test drive them, and then integrate them back into the rest of the application where right. things may not be as pure as you'd like. So I guess I'm, I'm, I'm pragmatic where I need to be, right? Yep. No, that makes total sense. Um, and I've gotten to know Justin Searles um, over the years. I'm curious, how big has Test Double gotten these days? We are, I want to say, 30 to 35, probably more like 30 agents, which is what we call our, our consultants. We call mm-hmm. them double agents. We have that whole spy theme. Um, right. So, yeah, we've definitely been growing uh, over the past couple of years. Uh, our name's getting out there more, especially in some of the networks we aren't, haven't traditionally been a big name in. Um, Cause I know, you know, previously we've been big in the Ruby community, but you know, yep. we're, we're making some of those pushes more into JavaScript. And now with Elixir and Elm, we have a couple of other Elixir projects going on. So it's really cool to see Elixir gaining so much ground. Yep. Yeah. It's really interesting to watch. Um, we, we started an Elixir podcast last year and it's been interesting to be involved in that community too. So yeah. yeah, it's, it's really the whole community itself is blossoming, I think. Yep. So one question I've kind of added to the list that I ask people on these shows now is what does a day in the life of Jeremy Fairbank look like? <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, that depends some days on what uh, days I have a slew of meetings or not, but right. I'd say a typical day for me, I get up really early since I am in Hawaii and my client is in mountain time. So mm-hmm. daily stand up for me is at 6 a.m. So I'm usually, I'm getting up 10 minutes before stand up. <laughs> whatever minimally necessary to get ready to present myself in front of a camera. Right. Um, 
and do stand up. And then after that, um, mainly just go with whatever the work is for that day. Um, mm -hmm. I guess, you know, being a consultant, that's a good mix of straight delivery, um, pairing, mentoring, answering questions, or um, trying to provide support with, you know, PR reviews um, or whatever type of meetings that might need to be coordinated. So it's, I guess it depends on the context, but those are the, the bucket of things that typically happen within my day. Definitely a lot of heavy pairing. Like that's, that's something we really value at Test Double and we try to um, share that um, sort of importance of it, you know, with the clients we work at that, you know, we feel it does help produce more higher quality software. Yeah, that makes sense. And then, yeah, I just kind of like to give people a picture of the person that we're talking to, um, you know, and so you've already mentioned that you, you know, you live in Hawaii, um, you're married, you have a four-year-old. Um, I mean, what do you do when you, you know, at the end of the day, you've got some downtime, you know, what do you spend your time on there? Do you watch sports? Do you go outside? You know, you get a free weekend, same kind of thing. Yeah. So it's usually a, a mix of, we may go down to the beach and just chill, play in the water, um, or just soak up some sun. Um, we also really love to hike. Um, uh -huh. There's lots of good hiking spots here on Maui. So um, we definitely enjoy doing that. Um, yeah, it's, I don't know. We're pretty chill. I, so we, we did deal with, um, we just recently got all of our household goods, even though we shipped them like way back in November, <laughs> we, we dealt with a, a bit of a moving nightmare, but we, we finally got our stuff. So all that to say, like, I finally have my guitars. So I've been trying to pick back up, you know, oh, playing you guitar. Uh -huh. Um, so it's one of those things I, I really enjoyed. I, I've been playing since I was eight years old. Oh, wow. Um, so I've been playing for a long time and, you know, through my teenage years, I was, you know, I had a really good guitar teacher and I was trying to learn, you know, how to do improvisation, uh, with jazz and blues mm -hmm. style of guitar. And I never really honed that as well as I would have liked to. Maybe it's cause I was just one of those those dumb teenagers that didn't pay attention enough. I don't know. <laughs> but now I'm like, I have all these old tab books from back when I was a teenager and like, I'm really interested in this stuff now. So I'm, I'm really trying to right. learn better with, you know, what time I, I do have. It's, I don't have a ton of free time always. Um, um, cause I, I just finished up the, the Elm book too. So. Oh yeah, that's right. You're releasing an Elm book on Prague Prague if I remember right. Yes, that's correct. Um, it's programming Elm. So just within the past month finished all the content for that. So it's, it's going through some remaining production processes over at Prague. Um, so the book should be out. The book is out. You can buy it um, on Prague's website. It says it's a beta ebook, but it's, it's the full content. And then the, the full printed and fully laid out book will come out. Um, looks like probably late June, early mid July. So that's, it's been an exciting adventure too. And that, if this had been, if this interview had been, I guess like a, a few months ago, I would have been said that was most of my free time was just working on the book. So. <laughs> yep. That, that's, I know how much work goes into a book and uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so kudos to you for that. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Well, um, the last part of this show is picks. Do you have some things you want to shout out about on the show? Yes, I do. So I, I did pick my book for a pick um, just to try to promote it a little. So that's Programming Elm. And I'll share a link um, in the chat. Um, the other thing is there's this really cool show I enjoyed. I binged it way too quickly on Netflix, which is probably what everyone does with a show they like. It's called the Umbrella Academy. Mm -hmm. It's, um, it's kind of a, it's, it's based off a dark horse comic, which actually was written by the lead singer of my chemical romance, which I just recently learned. I thought that was really cool. Um, but it's, it's got a kind of an X-Men vibe, but more of a, these, all these children are born 
on the same day inexplicably, even though their their mothers had never had not been pregnant up to that point. And so it's like this, you know, this mysterious um, aspect of it. And so this eccentric billionaire goes around and adopts all these children um, because he learns they have special abilities and raises them and trains them to be this team. And so the story itself actually takes place many years later when they're all adults and the father passes away. And so all these kids are reunited. And so the, I don't want to spoil anything, but the story kind of unfolds from there and you kind of see each of those people dealing with their, so to speak, vices of having grown up in that environment with this very stern um, adoptive father who, you know, raised them to be this superhero team. So it's a really cool story, I think, and has some interesting themes in it. And huh. yeah, it's, it's cool. I, I really enjoyed it. I don't know. I guess I like superheroes and sort of dark themes. <laughs> yeah, it sounds a little bit like Orphan Black with a little bit of a different play on some of the themes. But I'll have to maybe you can share a link with me or whatever that is. I'd like to check it out. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then the last thing. So I don't know if um, you've heard of the Beyond Burger. But I, so I have a, I eat a plant-based diet and I had not tried one of these yet, even though they've been out forever. And I recently got to finally try one. Um, and it was actually really good and it, it tasted like the real thing. And I know for some vegans, that's can be kind of a stopping point, but uh, personally for me, it, it doesn't bother me as long as I know it, you know, it's made from plants. I'm completely happy and it was really tasty. So whether you're, you know, plant-based or not, it's still something cool to check out if you want to try it. I think it, it tastes a lot like the, the real thing. And um, yeah, so that was, that was interesting for me. And yeah, those are my picks. Nice. Yeah, so I'll throw out a few picks. Um, one of them is Orphan Black. I'll just pick it. I haven't, uh, I mean, the, the show's been out for a while. I think the last season was like 2017. Um, and, and I don't want to give away too much of it if you haven't seen it, even though, um, my personal rule on spoilers is one year and then you can spoil it. Um, just cause you know, you can't hold back forever, but, um, anyway, if you haven't seen it, uh, basically it starts out with this girl. Um, she's coming back. She's kind of had a troubled past, um, comes back to, uh, wherever she's from. I think it's in Canada somewhere. And, uh, she she sees a woman down uh, the train platform and this woman looks just like her. And that woman steps out onto the tracks in front of a train and, and dies. And so, you know, she assumes this woman's identity and then gets pulled into this huge... Um, uh, anyway, there, there's this whole thing going on and so you start learning the back backstory of why these two women are identical and you know all of the other things that are going on i mean it's just really really interesting so um anyway and and the woman whose identity she takes over is a police woman and you know and she's this criminal so it's <laughs> anyway it gets really interesting really quickly but yeah it's kind of got that that weird family dynamic and you know who are all these people and you know why are they all identical and and stuff like that so anyway um I really enjoyed it. Um, it was it was one of my guilty pleasures. So uh, anyway, I'm going to shout out about that. Um, also, by the time this goes live, we'll probably have the new redesigned devchat.tv up and running. Um, and so I'm going to throw out a few picks on that. I've been working on it for a while, so I've probably picked these things before. If I have, bear with me. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, I've been hosting the beta site on um, Netlify. And Netlify is a sponsor on some of the shows. Um, but that's not why I picked them. I picked them because it's really freaking easy to, to do stuff with them. So I'm liking that. Um, 11DJS is another uh, pick for me. Um, and that's the the platform that I'm using to put this stuff together. And um, yeah, then uh, I just have the project up on GitHub. And uh, you all can submit pull requests if you want. Um, but yeah, I'm getting ready to pull all that stuff together and get it linked over. I've got to train my team on how to post to it um 
but beyond that, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the way that things have gone so far. And I'm kind of toying with the idea of seeing what I can get away with with Netlify CRM um, as opposed to making my team learn how to commit because um, they're not developers. Um, commit the show notes to Git and then pushing it to GitHub. Um, that might be a little bit too much uh, for them. Um, I may also just do a training video on how to create a file and, you know, post it in the GitHub interface. That might be easier on them. I'm trying to figure that p piece out. Um, we've been using WordPress before, but WordPress has gotten so bloated and just problematic in some ways that having it on a static site is going to be really nice. And then I can go in and I can apply all of the SEO techniques um, to static uh, HTML pages. So anyway. So I'm going to pick those. Um, and uh, yeah, then we're also getting ready to start a few more shows. And I'm toying very seriously with actually putting out two JavaScript jabbers every week. And so if you're interested in doing that or interested in helping me do that, uh, let me know. But uh, yeah, other than that, um, those are my picks. Uh, now, Jeremy, if people want to find you online, where do they go? So you can... Find me on Twitter as El Papa Pollo. I'm kind of an infrequent Twitterer, but uh, it's El Papa Pollo, E L P A P A P O L L O. I know that it's a lot of L's and P's there. So, it <laughs> um, yeah. And then if you want to check out the book, you can go to programming elm.com. Um, I have a lot of some blog posts there too on some other cool tips and tricks for Elm. It has a link to the book, which you can buy from Prague Prague's website. So those would be the best places to check me out. Nice. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Thank you, Charles. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap this up and we will be back next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.